Okay, guys, 14 on the line. And you know what, Kevin, I would love to just, uh, let's start with you introducing yourself. Tell us what you do. What is your position? And what do you do? Um, I have a handful of different positions. Um, I work I work with the Berry Growers of Ontario as their general manager. Um, that's probably the job that keeps me the busiest. I'm also the executive director of the North American Strawberry Growers Association. And I have a consulting business, so I spend time in the field uh, working with growers as well. Um, so what is that, what is that going to look like? All those jobs that you do, to what extent are you out in the orchards uh, looking at people? Are you um, helping them if they have problems? Do they call you if they have throw up problems? When do you interact with them? Yeah, I do get I do get calls from our members. Uh, I just had a, a call from uh, Minnesota this morning, actually, from a from a grower there. No, the the nice thing about the jobs is it is it, it gets me out into different farms across the province and and working with the North American Strawberry Growers Association, we do uh, we have a couple meetings a year and we do tours and um, yeah, so I've been in probably about twenty different states and uh, see a lot of the. Uh, a lot of berry production in different areas. We do international tours, so I get a lot of exposure that way, um, at least from a strawberry perspective, a lot. But when we're out to those farms, we, we see all kinds of berry crops and other crops as well. Um, typically, a lot of our berry growers um, grow more than one one berry type, so they may grow strawberries, raspberries, uh, blueberries, raspberries, or all three, or you know even more, some of the other smaller acreage berries as well. So yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, um, that's one of the things that I really like about uh, about working with the organization is you see a lot of different different uh, production systems, different regions, and so on. So yeah, that's very cool. And it's interesting because you said to me on the phone when we were chatting earlier that perennial crops are harder to grow. So can you tell me why you said that to me? What do you think about perennial crops? Well, I mean, when you think about it, if you plant a vegetable crop, you could you know, seed it in May and and harvest it by July or August, and then you're done. Whereas with a perennial crop, you know, you're dealing it for, in, in many cases, several years, uh, in the case of blueberries, for example. Um, so yeah, the, you know, the pest pressure, I think, uh, you know, you don't have a break um, in between. You don't get to uh, rotate crops as much. So you get, you know, some pest and disease buildup. And, and those, a lot of those crops tend to have more challenges with them. Uh, and, and, you know, you've got to deal with fertility for several years as well. So you, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't know, I always say that annual crops are a little bit more forgiving and, and because probably just because of the length of time they're in the ground. That makes sense. Okay, Kevin, let's start with your slide presentation. We are going to do part one. Uh, part one is in general, a little bit about growing berries uh, in a professional environment. Do you want to open the slideshow and you will start to take us through and after the first little batch of slides um, we will bring i'll ask some questions the students have some great questions so why don't you open the slideshow and in the meantime hello to everybody who joined us a little bit uh just in the last last little bit we are so happy to have you on the line and we're happy to be together so this is super fun Okay. okay, so let's get started, Kevin. So tell okay. us about berry production. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about berry production in Ontario, and you'll see some slides that are from different parts of uh, the country and the world as well in here. Um, the focus is going to be on strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries, and hopefully, if time permits, we'll talk about some of the other more um, minor blueberries, uh, or minor berries, I should say, that, that are grown in the province. Um, and yeah, we're going to go through things. I'm going to spend a bit more time on strawberries because they're the biggest crop here and they have the most production systems and so on um but also a lot and a lot of the stuff will carry over uh to the other different types of berry crops but we'll we'll talk about each one of them specifically i, I want to talk a little bit about marketing because this is something that often gets overlooked and we want to make sure that you know before this is what we tell people before you plan to grow anything you really should know how you're going to sell it because a lot of people can grow things, but if you don't have, a, you know, a good plan from a marketing perspective, it's really, you know, you set yourself up for disappointment. So um, in the berry business, there's a lot of different options um, for considering, uh, for consideration. 
the the berry industry in Ontario was primarily built as a pick your own um, pick your own uh, operations, and that was probably in you know in the 60s and 70s uh, when those kind of started and peaked in uh, peaked in the in the 80s or mid 80s when pick your own was extremely popular. And growers really didn't have to do a whole lot else. I mean, people came out to the farm and and pick things clean. And uh, but we've seen you know the people's people's lives change, and with different uh, generations, the pick your own has uh, dropped off uh, to considerably lower than what it once was. So we're seeing stuff that uh, different different options. So people still come to the farm. The the, the berries will be picked, um, you know, by the growers and then marketed uh, on the farm. At, at a, what we call, call them farm stands or on farm markets or whatever you know, you'd like. Um, farmers markets, which have really had an evolution probably over the last 15 years, I would say. Um, there's far more farmers markets out there, and this is something that, that our growers didn't tend to go to before because they didn't they didn't really need to. Um, but these markets have been quite, become uh, quite popular, quite lucrative uh, at some markets. They're very popular, as, as many of you know. Um, you know, you can do a lot of one-stop shopping with those. Um, the other thing is that we see some farms that are not located in the best, you know, and have the best locations from a marketing standpoint. So what they've done is they've, they've brought, I always say, bring the berries to the people. And they've found places in cities, in parking lots, uh, you know, side of the road, whatever you want to call it, that, uh, that they're using for for options, basically, like I said, bringing the, bringing the product to the people, making it more convenient, because that's what our society really looks for is convenience now. Um, we do some growers go right directly to they have a relationship with individual stores, and uh, they, uh, they they will deliver directly to those. Um, other growers deliver to the warehouses, so <clears throat> a company like Law Boss or Sobeys or Metro will have a um, a warehouse distribute they call it a distribution center. So berries will be delivered there, and then they'll go to individual stores. Is there? Um, we see we see growers selling to other growers that you know maybe I don't grow blueberries, but I'd like to sell them at my farm or my farm market. And so we see we get some buying within our members and so on uh, of that community. Uh, there's always value adding um, jams, pies, wine. I I should have added to the etc. Probably right now is some of the things trending is is cider. I mean cider. And a beer. We've actually had lots of calls for beer. People wanting to, to use uh, berries in, in when making beer. Uh, there's community sh uh, shared agriculture, which is a bit of a uh, trend uh, lately, which uh, with people who sell through that system, where people you know pre pre order or pre buy um, a share at a local farm and they get a variety of products at a weekly or bi weekly basis. And the last thing is that we've always lived, you know one of our looks or one of the people has. It, People in our industry has talked about convenience stores and something that we could sell small quantities and, and, and find a market there. So lots of different options for marketing. So from there, I want to talk about site selection. And as I mentioned before, site selection, uh, it, this goes, a lot of this information basically goes for all the different berry types. Um, as you can see, there's long-term implications. As I said, it's a perennial crop, so you have to think about things. and and the question that I always ask is how much land do I need? Because you have to think about rotations. I mean, you can't grow strawberries upon strawberries upon strawberries. They're there for a few years, uh, depending on the production system. And you don't want to be uh, um, going back to the same uh, piece of piece of land to uh, to grow. You do need to rotate. You do need to you know give that soil a break and, and regenerate it by growing some other crops or, or some cover crops and so on. So there's a lot of different uh, things to consider when you're cho choosing a site. Um, obviously, there's, as we talked about marketing, logistics, if you're doing pick your own or you're doing, um, you know, uh, sales at the farm, you want to be close to your market. Vis visibility from the road is a great marketing or promotion tool, I'll call it. And the parking, um, you know, depending on what type of activity you're in, parking will be important as well. And uh, you know how far do you want to be? You can see here below people taking a wagon ride because you know it's not within walking distance. And that's what you get when you get into rotations and so on. Is that sometimes it, it's a little bit more work getting people to uh, to where the berries are have to be picked. From a production standpoint, um, 
you know, we look at some different things. We want to talk about, um, you know, slope of the field. You can have a flat field, but you really need to have good drainage. Um, transport from the field, because you may be moving product in and out when you're picking. If you're picking and selling at a wholesale level, then that might be might be more important, but you've got to get the, the crop to uh, where you're selling it. Um, irrigation is important. Um, you want a you want a good quality uh, water source. You want something that has enough volume, um, because sometimes you'll be uh, you'll be requiring perhaps to be spraying for things like the frost control, which requires a larger volume of water. And then there's things like buffer zones and so on to to uh, to make sure that you're not having any impact on the environment around you. Um, from a site selection standpoint, we also look at food safety. Uh, you know, things like things, what, what's the history of that field? Has it had sludge, sewage sludge put on it? Is there runoff, potential runoff from barns or pastures? So you, you kind of have to consider that. In a lot of cases, this isn't really a consideration for many growers, but in some cases, you have to kind of know what your neighbors are and know the history of that soil. And the other thing is, thing is, is the field known to be frequented by deer or wildlife? I mean, deer can be quite damaging. But also from a food safety standpoint, you don't really don't want them in there and uh, leaving things leaving things behind that really uh, don't belong there. So uh, something just to, again to to kind of go through in there. Um, I like to look at things. You know, those those other things are obviously very important. But really, if you if you want to be a successful or a good grower, you want to make sure that you okay. have a site and soil that is you know that is going to be good for production. So happy plants is really important. Well-drained, a sandy loam is kind of an ideal soil, um, whether it's raspberries, strawberries, or blueberries, really that's kind of what we're looking at. But well-drained is something that we'll talk about over and over again. And a pH, in, in the case of strawberries, the pH is 6.0, 6.5. We'll see when we go to the other berry types that that pH changes. Um, soil characteristics, ideally you don't want to plant in heavy pet clay soils. I've seen very successful um, production in clay soils, but again, they're well drained and they're not, I wouldn't call them really heavy clay soils um, where you can make brick out of them, but they're something that's, you know, that is something that is manageable and would work for. Um, organic matter, of course, is, is always important. It is, as you know from some of your soil courses, that organic matter really um, helps with uh, the availability of nutrients. And um, and has you know of course other other great characteristics um, to make it to basically make a good soil profile of having adequate uh, organic matter. A compaction is something that you want to avoid, and um, you can see in this picture here you can kind of look at it. It's a bit small, but those that's those are strawberry plants planted on a little bit of a raised bed. So just to get them up off the ground and uh, in a field that may be a little bit heavier, may hold water a little bit longer. So uh, organic matter, as I mentioned, there's a lot of good uh, things come out of having adequate um, organic matter soil structure, better aeration, um, oxygen, as we know, is really important to, uh, um, to roots and to, to having uh, them grow to their maximum, um, maximum capabilities. Um, organic matter adds water holding capacity, as I mentioned, nutrient holding capacity. And of course, you want to aim for a reasonable amount of organic matter. And we talk about 3 to 4% on sort of sandier soils and perhaps more in clay soils. Um, with rotations, we talked about having um, some land base and so on for rotations. In the case of strawberries, um, there's things you want to avoid. So you really don't want to go directly into a a path, field that was in pasture or turf because there's a potential for white grub problems in there. Um, this, from a disease standpoint, verticillium is a common soil disease and it's uh, most common in the, in the solanaceous family, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers. Um, so it can, you don't want to follow those crops ideally. Um, you'd like to have a rotation of them for at least two or three years. Um, raspberries and strawberries, obviously you don't want to go back in. Um, after that, and again, black root rot, um, nematodes disease, which is a nematode and disease type of um, complex, 
uh, you don't want to go in after strawberries for, as an example when there's other other crops that that are good hosts for uh, nematodes and other diseases you want to avoid listed here you know apples and ginseng are, are a couple of examples um, also site selection you have to really know the herbicide history if there's been any herbicides used um, so some of them have will have uh, on the labels they have plant back restrictions recropping guidelines so there are we've found through uh, unfortunately through trial and error that certain herbicides will be very damaging to uh, uh, crops growing after them you know here in this case it's strawberries um, so some of these group two herbicides and group two 27 can uh, can be a can be a bit of an issue so just just something to be aware of something to keep track of as you go through as you go through uh, your planning process. Um, when we look at um, soil preparation, there's very, it's basically some simple steps. Obviously, you want to do some soil sampling because this field is going to be in there for a few years. In the case of strawberries, it's going to be two, anywhere between two and four years in most production systems. Um, so it's really important to soil sample, particularly you're, you're looking for fertilizer recommendations based on those results, but also the pH is really important. So that's, you can do this typically, you know, you do it once and if you correct things and make them where, where the plants uh, like to be, then, then it's kind of a one, can be a one time um, planning as a pre-plant process. Uh, weed control, very important. Um, weed control some seems to be probably one of the biggest challenges to growing strawberries and what shortens their lifespan in a lot of cases. So controlling weeds prior to planting is pretty important. You can subsoil if you have some compaction issues. And um, there's some different things if you're wanting to try to boost your organic matter. You can grow cover crops and they can have a dual purpose for, for managing weeds and perhaps even managing things like nematodes, but also can add some much uh, uh, light organic matter. Okay, so that's kind of um, the planning process and the preparation process. Um, in strawberries, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different production systems. The one that that has been historical one is the matted row system, and this is one where plants are planted. Um, you know, they'd be planted in 2020, sometime in April or May, hopefully, and you would you would manage them for this year, and then you would start picking them in in 2021. And so that is the traditional system that you'll see most in Ontario. And most in the northeast, uh, northeastern part of North America is probably the most common one. The second uh, most popular one is day neutral uh, strawberry production or ever bearing. We've seen a lot of our growers that have historically grown matted row have either switched to day neutral production, but in most cases they've just added it as a way of extending their season. So now you know we can have strawberries, start picking strawberries in June, and pick right through October if. Uh, if if we have a good combination of different types of uh, varieties there. So um, an annual plastic culture system, I mentioned this, it's an annual system, it's grown on raised beds and plastic. That's not, it's not very popular um, in, in the Northeast. It's more of a, a Southern, if you head to, you know, North Carolina, Georgia, that area, this is a, typically the system they'll grow um, as you head south from, basically from Maryland. So um, a wading bed system is a, is a system that they use in Europe where you actually can kind of program, you bring plants out of the cooler and you plant them so that you can harvest at different times. This, this has been tried and uh, really not that economically um, feasible here. And it, there's some other issues of having good plant supply as well. And we do a lot, see a lot of season extension. We'll talk a little bit about row covers and tunnels, both in a matted row system and a day, day neutral production system, but also in a substrate production system. And substrate is a new one um, and substrate and greenhouse production are more or less similar in what you're using to grow the plants in it's just what what kind of structure that you're you're producing them in and the season that you're trying to grow them. but we'll talk a little bit about those ones as well um, I'm going to go through just a series of pictures here and this is a matted row system and I don't know how well you can see it but there's two rows of strawberries being planted here and uh, 
they're, they're basically going in the ground as dormant plants, um, dormant bare root plants. So they've been grown by a propagator um, that grows, you know, specializes in growing plants. They're purchased by a, what we call, would say is a fruit grower. So this fruit grower is plant, planting plants. In this case, I know because I can recognize this, where this farm is, is those plants are being planted five feet apart between the rows and those probably be about 16 inches between plants. And that's pretty common. We can go anywhere usually from um, you know, three feet apart or approximately a meter apart to five feet apart, which is you know a little over a meter and a half. So it, it, there is some variability in that, but that's, that's what we're getting with the, this in this particular case. And you can see there's, I don't know if you can see those plants, but there's individual plants planted you know, so far apart, and they're just basically going in. They get a little bit of water with them, some fertilizer in that water, and they're uh, planted in, and the soil is basically pressed down so that you get soil contact, which is very important, have good firm soil contact with the roots so that they can get the moisture that they need. Um, this, is a, this is a matted row plant. This is a really nice looking matted row field. You can see that the plants are really going up and healthy. This is kind of the year, this is the year after planting. So this is just as, just prior to harvest. You see a really nice layer of straw there. Um, straw is pretty important in, in berry production for a number of reasons. And we use it to cover the berries in the, over the winter to protect them from the cold. Um, and then, then they're raked off into the row. They help keep the berries clean. They help maintain moisture. They provide weed control. And, uh, and, and uh, again, just a, it's a comfort as well for people picking in there uh, with the straw in there. So a lot of different functions for the straw. It eventually, it adds organic matter to the soil as well. So a lot of benefits of straw. Um, just progressing through the season, I said this is year two. You've planted. Um, you've got those beautiful plants. All of a sudden, now they're into, uh, into flowering. Um, the one thing that to notice with in the matted row system, we're typically growing what we call June-bearing uh, strawberry varieties, and some people would refer them as to short as short day varieties. And the difference with them is that they tend to produce a large flush of fruit all at one time. <clears throat> and so what you'll see when a particular variety is that you'll pick it anywhere from two to maybe four weeks would be the maximum you would pick a variety, but basically any for where you know from ten to ten to twenty days you'd pick this, pick this fruit off it. So as you can see, it all comes into bloom at around the same time. I didn't have a lot of time to get into strawberry physiology, but if you look at a strawberry flower, it has primary flowers, secondary flowers, and tertiary flowers. And that's kind of how you get your season um, to go maybe to 20, like I said, to 20 days with a particular variety. Um, here's a, just a, just a kind of a pretty picture of, uh, Fruit production, as you can see, you've got all that big flush of fruit. The larger fruit is probably the, uh, the, the primary berries, and you can see the smaller ones. They'll continue to grow and get larger, but the, the, the primary fruit or the, and the secondary fruit, obviously the largest one, make it a little bit smaller as you go along. So. Um, so that's that's a little very quick um, walk through with the matted row. I just want to say from the matted row standpoint is that they'll plant them and say in 2020, they'll pick them in 2021 and hopefully they'll pick them in 2022 and sometimes they may go longer than that. There was a time when growers would keep fields for five years of picking um, but with challenges with virus and weeds and some other different problems that the, the picking number of years picking has really shortened up and so some growers, this would be as short as one year of picking, but in the most, most cases, it's two years. And, and we ideally, you'd like to see three, but that's, that's kind of what I, I hope for. Um, so I'm switching. These are, this is a day neutral planting um, that's probably been planted for about maybe three or four weeks. Um, they're all planted by hand. Uh, they don't have a machine like you saw earlier. These are um, planted individually. In this case, there's some different different systems for growing, but it's either usually a two-row system or a four-row system. And here it's a two-row system. 
These plantings are, um, I'd say, from the center to center to the next row is about uh, five feet. Again, um, that's pretty common. Between plants, you will see uh, probably, um, well, it'll be 12 inches, 10 to 12 inches between plants, and uh, they'll stagger them. So they'll be between the, the two different little rows in here. It's probably you know another eight to 10 inches. So that's that's a typical planting system. In the in a in a matted row system, you're looking at six seven thousand plants to the acre. In here, you're looking at twenty thousand plants. A significantly larger number of plants system, which increases obviously gives you some greater greater yield potential um, with that system. Uh, this is just another. This is a shot a little bit later in in the season. Obviously, there's some fruit being harvested. And so with these day neutral or ever bearing type of plants, the idea is that they, they, they produce flowers um, throughout the season. So day neutral basically means that it doesn't matter what the length of the day is, that flower production and fruiting production will continue. There are ebbs and flows within that production cycle where you'll get peaks and, you know, some peaks and valleys, but the, the hope is that you'll, have a fairly consistent supply of, uh, of, uh, of strawberries. Here is, this is, there's a couple different systems when you're planting. Um, so most growers, for the majority of the planting will be planted in the spring of the year. Uh, it should be the first thing planted because you want them to get out early and get a good start. Those plants are planted with bare root plants. So no soil um, is with them. This, this, is, this just shows you a fall planting. So growers will plant a, a percentage. In many cases, they'll plant in the fall, and these are plugs. So the plug plants um, grown. These are planted typically in August, in the middle of August to September. Um, and these are plug plants, and you, the growers will plant them to get an early harvest um, in the following year. So these ones will be planted in August, September and will be harvested as early as May, depending on where you're located. But they can be ready mid-May um, if you get a, if you have a, a nice spring and you use row covers to bring them along. So the difference, so what growers will tend to do is they'll plant the spring crop. And if you're in a warmer climate in Ontario, so in the Niagara region or southern Ontario, you can often carry that planting over for maybe a, a couple of picks in the spring. But then you've also, if you want to um, have fit picking in the spring, you would you would plant these ones in August and September, and you would pick them, you get a big pick first thing in the spring, uh, then you have a bit of a lull, and then they come back and you'll have them for, for the rain of the year, and then you, you would take them up. Just, uh, just here's a couple of shots um, of different systems. This is, a, this is a, again, a two-row system. These plants are a little bit long. Uh, they're, in, they're in a tunnel. Uh, you can get a better shot of the tunnel here. Um, this is this is actually in, from central Mexico, where where they put tunnels over. It seems like all the berries had uh, tunnels when when we last visited. So very interesting. You will see, uh, you know, those tunnels tend to be uh, somewhere around um, seven eight meters wide, and uh, and then the length of them. You know they can go on for for quite a length. So uh, there's the, the advantage of tunnels is you know is um, obviously it uh, keeps the rain off. Um, when we visited Mexico, we asked uh, we visited you know seven or eight different farms in, over a few days, and when we asked we asked the question to every every farm, and they all gave the same answer, and, and their answer was hail because they do have hail events there. But, so there's a lot of advantages to growing in tunnels. There's some season extension, of course. Um, there's diseases uh, that we can manage by not having rainfall on them, and uh, it's great for it's better for picking and for uh, fruit quality after picking when you don't have to. Um, some of these day neutral varieties uh, don't stand up; they get damage, rain damage, um, which is unusual. The, the matted row berries, the June strawberries, um, typically don't don't have those issues, but some of these day neutral berries don't don't like being rained on. Um, you get soft spots on them. <clears throat> so tunnels can be advantageous.
Um, there's different types of tunnels you hear talk about. This is a, we saw the ones that were called high tunnels. This is an example of a low tunnel. This is a denatural strawberries planted in a in a low tunnel system. And in this one, in this particular case, you can see the side is up here, and these sides come down. Um, again, you get advantages um, of disease control, um, keeping the rain off them, um, but the, the, the cost of these low tunnels is significantly less than what you would have in the high tunnel. But, I mean, there's a bit more labor because you're setting them up every year. But uh, anyways, they, they give an advantage, um, for, especially, for, especially for disease control, but also, as I mentioned, for that water damage, you can avoid some of that as well. And you get, you know, your, your crop can come on earlier and, and protect it from frost later in the fall, perhaps, as well. That's just a pretty picture of a bunch of tunnels for distance. So those are, again, the low tunnels. Um, I talked a little bit about season extension earlier. Um, this is just an example of, <clears throat> of row covers. Uh, should have better pictures of row covers, but this is just one picture. Um, and these ones are actually put on for overwintering um, to protect. Uh, these are protecting the day neutral strawberries. Uh, from a, from basically from the cold over the winter, and they'll leave them on here. Um, basically, they leave them on until to try to advance the crop. Uh, once you start to see about five percent bloom on, <clears throat> we'd uh, suggest suggest taking those those uh, row covers off. But we'll see row covers used uh, in a lot of cases. They'll be used in this it, with June strawberries as well. The mat in the matted row system, growers may put it on in the fall over winter. Uh, they'll put it. They'll rake straw first thing in the spring and put it on. Um, so there's a there's a lot of uses, and they'll use it for both advancing the crop, but also for frost protection. You can get a degree degree or two Celsius of uh, frost protection out of these uh, out of these little uh, covers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to switch. Lastly, to substrate production. This is new. Um, this is a this picture here is farm in Ontario. Um, this, Probably, I think this coming year will be maybe the third year in, in, into production. You can see this is a there's there's tunnels here. They haven't put uh, the plastic on yet, um, but they've set out the plants. And in this case, the uh, plants are planted in. You can see in these containers, and uh, these are day neutral plants. In this case, planted um, in these in these containers um, with its substrate production. So uh, there's no soil. It's a soilless mix. So and um, the recommendation is, is typically a mix of peat and coconut coir. Um, coconut coir is quite commonly used in a lot of different substrates. And uh, the research has found that in strawberries that uh, this combination is, has worked the best. So there's been lots of research. Um, this is quite a common practice in Europe um, that we, you know, we, we saw when we visited a few years ago. Um, so yeah, it's quite popular, but this is something um, that's happening now in Ontario and happening for a number of reasons. Um, one of the big reasons is the cost of labor is expensive. And that's what they tell you in Europe is that we, they switch to that system because they can, um, we hear different, different reports, but I've heard th that 40% labor savings for picking. And you'll see, kind of see why once you see these, these plants that are up off the ground. Even within this system, there's lots of different, there's two to a couple different production systems depending on where you want, when you want to harvest, and and where your market is. In Ontario right now, we're seeing it being primarily um, the field, what I'll call field or outdoor growers, tunnel growers, will be, uh, you know, they're still they're still planning to pick in that market of sometime from May to May through October. Um, so you're you're looking at at a regular the regular systems that that I talked about just before this um, for either fall plug production or um, spring production. There you go. That's just, there's another shot of what you get when you, this is, this was taken last fall uh, at another farm. And you can see those, the berries hanging down. They're very easy to pick. They all kind of, they all tend to hang down <clears throat> there and, uh, and the picking height, you're not bending down. Um, you can pick in carts and, and the picking these, these, Things sit to about a, a little over a meter off the ground, and um, and it's just at a nice height for picking. So that's kind of a, a, a 
the, one of the best uh, advantages. Again, you've got a tunnel, so you've got all those tunnel advantages as well. Or in this case, you look at it, it's, this is, a, so there's the high tunnel we talked about, the low tunnel, um, and this is what they call is an um, umbrella structure, which basically is providing um, rain protection. It, it, hence the word umbrella. It's just a, it's doesn't may not give you some of the other advantages of a tunnel, um, but again the cost is significantly less than a tunnel, or noticeably less. I guess it's still quite expensive, but um, it is kind of a kind of a neat system, and it's being done. This is a, this is a farm in Ontario as well. Um, lastly, um, this is a, a greenhouse structure. This is in the Netherlands, um, and uh, they're very very big on <clears throat> on grasshouse production. They have a great market there. People are very loyal um, to buying um, buying local produce, and they get a premium. Typically, get a premium for their product. And this is this was in November. It's the end of kind of the end of their season. The things are winding down. Um, but you can see this is a you know solid structure. It's a uh, same thing. And instead of having a structure, these are hung from the ceiling. In most cases, in the, in the new ones, and you know, we saw when we went to one particular farm that had just put up 10 hectares of, uh, of brand new glass houses when we were there. So, 25 acres of, of strawberries all all under one roof. I think there were two roofs. It was two two different bays. But um, here in Ontario, we've got uh, three or four growers that have invested in this. These are growers that were growing uh, greenhouse vegetables, and um, so now we're seeing greenhouse. You can go. In, Go in the stores and see greenhouse strawberries. Uh, typically, they they try to fill the market from September late through May, <clears throat> when there's not as much field production. But you'll you'll see those uh, see the greenhouse strawberries there now. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars uh, that you can choose. I I've listed six or seven here. Um, uh, there's probably twenty. You look in the catalogs of some of the propagators, but these are probably the most common or the most popular ones, uh, ones grown um, in, in Ontario. Uh, we have from a matter growth system, the June type strawberries. We have early varieties. Uh, Annapolis <clears throat> is one of the common ones. There's another one called Wendy that I didn't list, but those are kind of the earliest varieties. Um, Cavendish is more of a early mid-season variety. Um, Myra and Jewel. Our um, varieties that are grown more, more, more from a wholesale standpoint um, and shipping standpoint. Um, but uh, Cavendish would be considered a pick your own berry. Cabot, very, very large berry, would be considered a, um, a pick your own berry as well. And we've got varieties like Governor Simcoe, um, which was um, bred here in Ontario. And then there's a couple other varieties Valley Sunset and Malwina. These are late varieties. And, and so when you look at these varieties, you'd probably choose uh, you know, probably three varieties, at least three to four varieties uh, to get, make sure that your season was as long as possible in, you know, in June and early July, and, um, and then also uh, not to have any gaps. When it comes to day neutrals, um, the most common variety grown in Ontario is Albion. It has great fruit quality. It's maybe not the biggest yielder, but the fruit is fantastic, and if you've ever had an Albion strawberry in September when the nights get colder, it is one of the sweetest strawberries you'll taste. Um, it's both Albion and Seascape are, and those varieties listed below, below Monterey and San Andreas, Cabrillo and Potola, all <clears throat> California bred strawberry varieties from the University of California, um, and uh, they're they have their suitabilities here, but they're not ideal, obviously, not being bred uh, in Ontario. We have a new one that's um, being marketed. But we haven't had a really good look at it called uh, Dynamic, I guess is the way you pronounce it. It was a, a variety that came out of uh, the Agriculture Canada breeding program in Quebec. And uh, it was just, uh, they're just starting to propagate it up and you'll see, we'll start, we'll get a good look at it this year. There's a bunch of uh, uh, test trials that are going out, but we're hoping that that because it was bred here in Canada, that it'll have some uh, better overwintering capabilities and so on than some of these California varieties. Um, <clears> There's <throat> just some pretty pictures of varieties. I think this one 
my memory cellar serves me right is Valley Sunset, one of those uh, later varieties that I talked about. Um, this is some Jewel strawberries, and uh, this is a, just a, a sample picking of some Albion uh, from uh, one of our Ontario growers. You can see this really very attractive fruit, and uh, they really they they really do a nice job of uh, of making those the, the berries the way they lay them on top. They're very very beautiful. Okay, just um, just going. I'm going to go th quickly through the season from the standpoint of what happens um, with strawberries. You see, you plant you, you basically you fertilize your field first. Um, you know, you do field preparation. That would be you know the cultivation that you need to do to prepare a good uh, now seed bed, um, and then you do your your spacing and your uh, field setting. You're setting out those plants, um, as we talked about a little bit earlier. That's kind of the planting process. Um, after planting, you're managing in the this is the first year, so this is a, in the in those June or matted row systems. You're managing weeds basically throughout the season. Uh, insects. There's typically not a lot of insects, but there are a couple that you really have to watch for. Um, there's a few a few diseases to to be monitoring for. We don't tend to sometimes don't tend to do have to do a lot for that, but it's something that 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 is monitored. Um, one thing that's been that, that there's been a lot of research done on is blossom removal. Um, basically, we'll, the grower, uh, growers will send uh, their employees out, will go out and, and pick off the blossoms. And this just pushes the energy um, from fruiting into the plant because you want to you want those plants to fill in the rows as quickly as as possible. <clears throat> they fill in the rows. Um, you you basically when you plant, you're planting a single plant or is referred to as a mother plant, and then the strawberry plant will produce runners, and those runners are what usually fills in uh, the gaps, and those are often referred to as daughter plants. And now. And so the mother plant and the daughter plants will uh, fill in the row, and that's what you'll harvest the following year. And then at the end of the year, you're doing some kind of row cover, um, whether it be straw or row cover for overwintering in, in year one. Um, harvest year, a lot of the same things between you know pest management stuff, uh, frost control could be a possibility. Um, you know, you're irrigating as need be. Um, hopefully not for frost, but for uh, hopefully just for providing sufficient moisture as the strawberries have a big demand for water. Um, you can see in, in strawberries, we, we did some uh, timing trials of irrigation, and uh, we noted that uh, the uptake of, uptake of water actually doubles uh, when, when strawberries uh, go into bloom, in, from bloom through first harvest. So there's a lot of moisture um, required. Uh, you get into harvest and post-harvest handling, and then there's a process at the end. Of, but once you're done uh, harvesting, it's uh, called referred to as renovation, where plants are mowed, fertilized, the rows are narrowed. Um, sometimes the, uh, the, the row to, uh, between rows to narrow the rows, but to incorporate the straw, and that's called the renovation process. Okay. So oh, take a deep breath. That's yeah. We've gotten through strawberries. Oh my gosh, you covered a lot. Guys, that's amazing. Okay, I love the production systems. So what I want to do now for a minute, everybody have a thought, uh, have a think. Do you have any questions on what we've covered so far? And in the meantime, I'm going to put up a poll. I hope you can see it. Um, so I wrote a few little quick polls I want you to vote on. If you can see it, please tell me. Um, I'm going to publish it right now. Oh, crumbs display. Okay, so what, in your opinion, is the easiest berry that you have ever grown? What's the easiest berry to grow? So everybody answer the poll. And at the same time, I'd like you to come up with questions. If there's anything that you want to ask, um, I'm just looking at the results of the poll. Are there any questions for Kevin? Next, we're going to go on to raspberries. We're going to talk about blueberries. Um, we will, this is the biggest part of the presentation, the strawberry part. The other parts will be a little bit smaller. Also, I wanted to remind you guys that you're taking notes, hopefully, and you will record the five, five new things you've learned in this, um, in this webinar today. 
five new and different things. Now, I'm going to start off the questions myself, actually. Um, and I want to say, uh, is there any berry in particular that tastes like the the raspberry, the the strawberries that you get in strawberry ice cream, that artificial strawberry flavor? What is the most yummy, sweet uh, strawberry that tastes like strawberry ice cream? Well, I mean, I think in, from a strawberry ice cream standpoint, <clears throat> a lot of um, some strawberries are grown. We don't grow them here in Ontario, but if you go to the West Coast, um, uh, particularly in Oregon and Washington State, um, they grow a lot of uh, uh, processing strawberries and they grow specific varieties for processing and, and um, whether it be Hagen dazs or, or any other um, a buyer, they tend to buy some specific varieties that have been grown um, for just for basically for processing. Cool. And these are varieties that are actually the breeding program out there is, is always focused on on varieties like that. And uh, we've got a question from Liam. Thank you, Liam. What material was used for the matted rows? Um, in matted rows, they're basically grown on bare soil, so. There, um, there's, there's no material, no, um, <clears throat> no special, uh, no special additives to the soil, no plastic. Um, so yeah, so it's just strawberries grown on bare soil, and straw added to it, and in some cases, a little cover, uh, if they, if they want to do season extension. Okay, and I'm just going to pick out a few questions. You guys all submitted some really interesting questions. Uh, one that came back uh, a few times is, are there any berry plants that you can grow in pots or indoors? So Hannah asked that. Uh, let's see. Um, Devinderjeet asked that. Who else, guys? Everybody was interested in potted. Can you yeah. grow potted berries? Oh, Absolutely. we lost you. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm here. Okay. My voice is here. My connection mm -hmm. um, No, I think... Uh, in um, <clears throat> as you saw with the, with the uh, substrate strawberries, you can grow you can grow strawberries in in containers. I think you can do it. I've, we've had growers grow you know raspberries in containers, blueberries in containers. They all can be grown in containers. The thing that you have to remember is that when you grow things in soil, the soil is um, <clears throat> is a little bit more forgiving. Um, it's got a little more buffering capacity, and when you're growing specifically in in um, in pots or in substrate, you have to you know, pay more attention to fertility and fertilize because that, that substrate typically does not have a lot of, uh, um, it has very little fertility in it, little to no fertility. Okay, and here's a question from Colton. And again, this is a general berry question. Um, are there any potential problems that can occur when using exclusion netting? Um, no, we see exclusion netting being used because of a uh, a new pest, the, the spotted wing drosophila, uh, an aggressive fruit fly. Um, yeah, I mean, with exclusion netting, I think the only thing you might consider, I mean, there's, when you change the environment, sometimes you you um, change the complex of problems. So I talked about um, tunnels, for example, they're a perfect example, and you may see some, something similar when you're growing an ex with exclusion netting, is that tunnels, and under a tunnel, and maybe under exclusion netting, you may see um, relative humidity uh, levels increase. And when relative humidity levels increase, you can, sometimes will see more of a disease like powdery mildew. Um, okay. You'll see less botrytis, less anthracnose because of no rain splashing, but you may see, you may see problems like that. The other thing that you always wonder about is, is, is um, pollination. Strawberries are wind pollinated. But they are also pollinated by bees, and and bees typically um, bee pollination typically produces larger berries on average than just wind pollination. Wow! So that was a great question, Colton. Thank you for that. Um, link to what you just said. Hannah asked. Um, she's talking about how does being grown in a nursery setting impact the pollination of the plant, if any at all. Does the fruit differ once leaving the nursery through sale or moving? Does the plant have issues with producing fruit after leaving other crops in the nursery? So the reason I'm reading that now is, you know, I don't know if the nursery um, issue is an issue here, but 
again, pollination, like you were saying, uh, is there are there problems when you have covered planting systems with pollination? Yeah, there there, there can be. Um, again, there may be limited uh, insect activity or be specifically to pollinate, um, but sometimes you may not have that that wind that goes through to to pollinate. So in those systems, in a greenhouse system, for example, they just they bring in bees, so they have no choice but to to do that because they don't have the the air movement and that to uh, to to blow the pollen. Um, yeah. So and now we have a question from Varindrajit. Do people in Canada grow berries during off season? And if yes, how do they grow them? Well, you saw that. You saw the, the greenhouse production. And um, <clears throat> in, in greenhouse production, um, they're planting they're planting in the summer months. Uh, they basically typically they clean the greenhouse in, out in June. They'd start planting again in August. They would plant large um, plug tray plants, I guess they call them, which are significantly larger, be like a four inch pot almost. Um, and those plants are basically grown and they have uh, enough um, fruiting crowns that uh, let's start producing in about six weeks time. So yeah, so then those, they, they're, they're day neutrals or ever bearing type strawberries. So the, if they uh, continue to fertilize them and manage the uh, temperatures and so on, um, then, then they'll be fine. And the interesting thing about strawberries is that they're cool weather. They're a cool weather berry. They don't like hot, hot, hot weather. And so it makes it a little bit less expensive to heat versus a tomato or pepper planting, for example. Okay, one more question, then we'll get the results to the poll. So hopefully everybody has voted in the poll. If you haven't, please do now. Um, Jess asks, um, she asks if there are any uh, berries that grow well in part shade. Um, ideally, ideally all berries grow best in full sun. Um, I think with anything, they, uh, they, there's a maximum amount of sun that, 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 a plant, that a plant can absorb. So, I mean, with, with part shade, as long as it's not too much shade, you could probably, you could probably grow, um, you grow stuff. And we see that, we see stuff, the homeowners and people growing in hanging baskets, growing strawberries and other things that, um, you know, don't have full sun, but they're still, they can still be productive, just maybe not as full production as what you would have in a commercial sense. Okay, perfect. Well, quickly, we'll get the answer to the polls here. So what we asked, what is, in your opinion, the easiest berry to grow? 35% of you guys said strawberries, 30% said raspberries, 0% said blueberries, 10% said blackberries, 0% uh, said all berries are easy to grow. Now, interesting, 20% of you said you've never grown berries before. So now hopefully you'll be inspired to try. And 5% of you said all berries are hard to grow. So I'm going to end that poll right now. So, okay, let's go on. Um, just a little time check. We've got 43 minutes left. So for the other units, we'll make them a little short. We'll have questions in between as well. But um, this has been so interesting so far. So back to you, Kevin. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about raspberries now. So site selection is, is basically the same as strawberries. Um, but when you're looking at other things, uh, pH changes. So we saw six... 6.0 to 65 uh, being ideal for strawberries. They'll grow, I mean, in a little bit lower pH or a little bit higher than that. Um, but when you go to raspberries, the pH is a little bit lower. Um, they prefer something, you know, 5.5 to 6.5 is, is their range. So that's what you should be looking for, what you should um, try to try to obtain in a, after doing a soil sample. Um, from a drainage standpoint, they do not like having wet feet and they will suffer a little bit more um, from not imperfect drainage, I would say. So that drainage is pretty, pretty important. The other thing to notice with note with raspberries is wind protection. And you'll see, um, you know, people often stake trees. We learned that, you know, like apples, for example, if you stake a tree and support it, you're, after five years, you can get up to 30% more growth. And raspberries are much the same. If they're just sitting there blowing in the wind, um, they're not growing, so uh, it, it it does affect the amount of height um, that you receive um, if it's a, if it's a, if you see a little bit of uh, over 
over over amount of wind, I guess, is uh, is what you want. So wind protection is good. And the other thing is, is that um, it's it's helpful uh, in winter time because you can get some winter injury uh, sometimes from some cold north winds. So something to consider. Um, <clears throat> some production systems for raspberries. There's an annual summer production. Um, we have what I call biennial production, which uh, is just a change to the annual summer production. We have other varieties, uh, primal cane or fall bearing um, varieties. And then we have a new system that people are experimenting with called the long cane system. Um, <clears throat> annual summer culture. So raspberries are a biennial plant. So in most cases, they grow a cane. Um, we call a cane a vegetative cane in year one that cane will overwinter and in year two it will come into uh, it'll, it, it turns into a fruiting cane and so when you plant raspberries you basically you're planting and then there's there is some there is a waiting period because uh, you plant you know raspberries you know two to three feet apart and uh, and you want them to fill in those rows so it usually takes usually you plant if you planted in 2020 you would get a small crop in 2021 and then a full crop in 2022. So two years after planting, you know, you're into full production. And in a summer production system, yeah, you're in full production um, from then on out. And we like to see strawberry plant or I'm sorry, raspberry plantings um, be harvested for eight to ten years um, if all goes well. Sometimes longer. You can have longer. Um, in a biennial system. Uh, we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And, and primocane or fall bearing. These are these are different varieties. And basically, the primocane is that vegetative cane that grows up in the first year. And so these varieties will actually produce fruit on first year canes. And and um, most of them have been chosen to do this because they'll produce a reasonably good volume of fruit. And so. What you'll see in an annual, like in summer raspberries, you'll see, you know, see harvest starting in early July, um, and with and go basically, you know, till maybe the beginning of August. The primary um, primal cane type production or fall bearing starts mid August, third week of August, and will continue on basically um, until you get a until you get a good frost. They slow down obviously if the temperature gets colder. Um, the way the, You'll see them go right into the right into the fall. In long cane system, I'll talk about that specific a little bit separately. Oh, we got a blank. Okay, so long cane production is is different. Um, this is kind of a biennial production. It's grown in soilless mix with protected culture. So typically grown in tunnels. Um, it's soilless, so you're using again uh, some sort of uh, soilless mix of uh, peat and and uh, perhaps quar and uh, you're basically you're growing these plants out. You have a year's worth of uh, uh, of growing those prima canes, the the ones that grow in year one that will turn into fruiting canes the following year, and uh, you're trying to get them to to grow to a height of it says one meter plus. You definitely don't want any less than one meter. You want at least one meter, but ideally 1.5 meters, maybe as high as much as 1.8. So what is it? Um, so basically, we're seeing specialized um, nurseries that are growing plants um, that you you would purchase. So you would basically you would purchase these canes. They're they're grown at the nursery, and then you uh, they're, they're, the nursery uh, takes them. They store them over winter, typically in a protected cold storage that does not freeze, and then they'll sell them. To you and the thing is that you're you're have in each one of these pots there's typically two uh, canes two raspberry canes per pot and the goal is to have um, a kilogram per cane or somewhere the goal is around 22,000 kilograms per hectare and this is this is very large like a typical um, summer raspberry <clears throat> production if you were to get five to seven thousand kilos per hectare, you'd be pretty happy. So the yield is significantly higher. Um, 
So what happens with these is that is that um, they crop within 10 to 12 weeks after planting. So you can actually program your picking a little bit with this. So you can take them out of cold storage and know that somewhere around 10 weeks after um, taking them out, they will harvest. You'll be able to harvest them. So you, you buy these plants, you, you basically you bring them in, you can set them all out if you like, or you can put them in cold storage, keep them cold, and then stagger production over the season. Um, there's, again, lots of raspberry cultivars to choose from. The most prominent variety grown in Ontario is probably Nova. Um, Boyne is a variety that can grow anywhere. It's very, very hardy, but it has small, small berries, and um, and it, they're, they're not that firm. They're, they're really lovely tasting, but they're not uh, they're not that great for um, you know for if you were to ship. So Nova is a very popular variety um, because it has a lot of those qualities. Um, you've got uh, these Boyne Nova Prelude is an early variety. Um, which is becoming more popular. Canby is a, is one that's uh, as well. Royalties of the purple raspberry. So most of the other ones are red raspberries. Eden is a new large um, variety of the Nova Scotia breeding program at Agriculture Canada. And uh, it's definitely, if you're in a, a southern part of uh, Ontario, it'd be definitely one to try because of the large fruit size. Um, fall bearing, we've got a number of different ones. Um, Autumn Britain was always the most popular variety for the longest time. Large fruit size, early harvest, um, polana, um, not so big of berries, but pretty darn reliable um, variety. Polka is probably the emerging variety right now. Uh, good fruit quality and good yields, and fairly fairly early. Heritage is a, is an older variety, um, very productive, small fruit, but uh, large production. There's lots of other varieties. Caroline is another one that people are trying. In a long cane production. The one thing about um, long canes, you'll see these varieties are all different than the ones above. And that is because those are all large fruited varieties. But they're also um, tender varieties. They're uh, tender from a wintering standpoint. They don't overwinter well. And so um, people do, and like in the Niagara region, you can most years get away with growing tulumi outside. Uh, Glen Ample probably, but you'll have years where you'll lose them. So in this case, you're storing them in a cooler. So they're in the long cane production. You want productive, uh, large size varieties. These Glen varieties are actually from Scotland, and um, our association has been bringing in some different varieties uh, to uh, for this production system. Okay, I'm going to just go through uh, some pictures to highlight some of these production systems. This just this one here is a um, this is a typical summer production system. You'll see that here, these are canes. All the ones up here are fruiting canes on the ground. There's new canes coming up. As I said, so you have a, every year you've got young canes, primal canes coming up, and the, the fruiting canes above them. And so you've got a, in an annual system, you're managing uh, both uh, fruiting canes and primal canes in the same year. Ah, just a pretty picture. This is uh, some, this is a, a this is the Boyne variety. As you can see, the fruit size is a little bit smaller, um, but it is extremely productive, uh, productive fruit. And here's just another shot of uh, some some green fruit, very healthy. Um, again, this uh, the, yeah, this uh, this is another uh, Boyne plant in a, in a uh, production system. So it's kind of hard to describe, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about biennial production. As I mentioned before, raspberries are biennially growing plants. So in this case, you see these, the two outside rows, the tall rows are fruiting. They're in their, they have fruiting canes up here. And in this cane, this case, this row was mowed down and all the canes in here are primal canes coming up. So these ones will not fruit. The middle row, will, the low ones will not fruit this year. They'll just spend their year um, growing primal canes. And in this case, they will pick off every other row will have fruiting canes. And you can see one of the, the other things that we do in a biennial system is that you'll see a really clean strip down here. Um, below the canes, it's very brown, and that's because they've used a herbicide to um, burn off the primal canes. So all the energy 
can go into the fruit and fruiting canes and improve yield and uh, and uh, and hopefully uh, hopefully basically what you're looking for increase yield and the other thing that's a bonus of the system is that when you have primocanes coming up in this system um, they often interfere or make it picking a little bit more difficult so that's a biennial system and as you can just see it here where they've, they've mowed, mowed them down in the fall which is uh, would be, always be my preference to mow them in the fall um, raspberries are grown in tunnels as well. <clears throat> raspberries grow ex exceptionally well in tunnels. They seem very well adapted. They grow extremely tall. Now here again is one of those tunnels. It's about eight meters wide. You have three rows of raspberries in it. Um, they'll grow, they, growers will grow both, uh, um, summer raspberries in them, but also grow fall bearing <coughs> in them as well. Raspberries are very sensitive to, uh, um, to rain and you can't pick them when they're wet. So that's a big bonus with uh, growing on the tunnels. Uh, just a little bit about the, the system in, in um, similar to what I talked about in strawberries, planting year and post plant in the, in the year of planting. You're going to work the soil and fertilize based on your soil tests. You're going to plant, set those plants out there, basically just planting them in the space in that you want. Um, sometimes when you receive those canes from the nursery, uh, they'll, they'll have a little bit longer cane. Some people encourage you to cut those canes off. So new canes can be produced and the energy goes on to the new canes. Um, in most cases we see sod between the rows, so you're planting grass um, between the rows to make picking easier and running equipment through um, a little easier. You're going to manage weeds, any pests and diseases, it's typically not a lot um, in that planting year. And irrigation is, again is, is pretty important to make sure that those plants have the best uh, chance of survival and optimum growth. So that's it for for raspberries. Very quickly, um, we'll move on to we want to have a um, some quick discussion on raspberries before we move to blueberries. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to start us off. We got a few questions, but so suckering is never a problem with raspberries. No, no. Basically, when you're when you're managing raspberries, I didn't talk a lot about it, but you're pruning when you're pruning. In this case of summer raspberries, just as an example. So those fruiting canes as a biennial plant, they basically, you know, grow one year, fruit the second year, and then they die. So um, from raspberries, when you're pruning, you're pruning right from the ground, as low to the ground as you can get, um, and typically pruning out those dead canes. In some cases, you're pruning out to manage the uh, population within the row. Um, ideally, in a summer production system, you want anywhere from 12 to 15 canes per meter of row. Um, so sometimes you're doing some thinning. Uh, hmm. So you will, you will sometimes thin those thin those plants out um, to make sure. I mean, raspberries can only they're they're not very efficient at um, gathering sunshine. They can only absorb so much sunlight. So when you overpopulate, when you have too many um, too many raspberry kings, too many raspberry leaves, um, your bacteria yield will, will decline um, once you get beyond that the optimal level. Gotcha. Okay, let's do some questions. We've got Lindy asks, what are some of the common cover crops that people use? Um, so depending on what type of uh, what your hope is for a cover crop. So there's cover crops that, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of, of mustard crops from the, um, uh, of mustard cover crops from the mustard family. So there's some different ones. There's some um, hot mustards, and those hot mustards have uh, benefits that um, they uh, help to manage nematodes, um, but also the the uh, mustards are are generally they're, they're pretty aggressive, um, so they can manage weeds as well. And in certain ones, uh, oilseed radish is a very um, popular one that's grown, and it it is produces the largest mass of actual organic matter or organic mass. Um, and it can do other things too. I'm a real big fan of wild seed radish um, because it can, it has, it produces a very lar long radish. It can break hard pans, help with compaction, um, and it's just a wonderful soil to work with afterwards. And, and in most cases, uh, it's winter killed. So you, you basically you start with a, you know, you start in the spring with a really nice, loamy, well, it's just a really beautiful soil. Uh, what you'll see now is people are doing a bit of mixes. Um, so they may put things like peas or 
um, or some um, grain type crops. You just have to be cautious with um, cover crops because um, some of them are attractive to nematodes. So that's those are the ones we try to avoid. Hmm. Okay. Mary Jane asks, um, can you tell us a bit about the most common organic fertilizer amendments used during field preparation? Um, people are still using, um, are still using <clears throat> compost, composted manures. Um, so composted manures are very help, helpful. Um, at a commercial level, uh, cover crops are, are also, uh, are also a main additive. It really isn't, um, if you can get compost, um, it's very helpful. Um, but, um, and large selling, we do see some growers purchasing, you know, on fields that they want to try to give a boost to, um, of buying a good amount of, of compost, usually from the municipal, municipal composting site, because that's where you can find some large volumes. So on a similar line here, we've got a question from Dion. What is a good organic alternate nutrient source instead of using harsh fertilizers that contain heavy salts? Um, yeah, there's a variety of, there's a variety of different <laughs> fertilizer sources out there. Um, so, I mean, there's kelp fertilizers, there's sea, seaweed based type fertilizers. There's um, different meals made of uh, um you know, you can, you know, there's soy meal, there's chicken meal, there's, you know, some different blood meal pro, pro, um, uh, products available. Uh, but yeah, you just, it's, it's those, um, those products are a little bit harder to work with. So you really have to have a good comfort level and a good understanding of how they release the, how they release their fertilizer, especially in nitrogen. Some of them are a little slower releasing, which uh, once you're comfortable with that, um, has some advantages. And in a lot of cases, the organic amendments have um, significant lower um, lower uh, concentration of, of fertilizer in them, so they, they just don't have some larger percentages. And and saying um, like some some fertilizers, I mean, talk about salt levels, depending on what, sh what types you buy, um, there's some of them that are not high in salt, and, and we avoid certain fertilizers and berry crops. Um, because of salt content in particular. Okay, I think the last question for now, Laura asks, we have a small white raspberry bush that doesn't produce very much fruit at all. And we are wondering why it's planted in the ground. Okay, um, there, there can be a number of reasons. Uh, it may be this the particular variety, um, that, that in a white raspberry, so it may, uh, it, some of those ones are, um, aren't as prolific as some of the red raspberry varieties, so that, that could be possibly uh, the issue. Um, sometimes over time, we've seen uh, some different challenges with raspberries. Virus in particular can sometimes have an impact on raspberries as they get older. Normally, you don't see that until the planting's, you know, is four or five years old um, and older, uh, but that may be it. So, as I said, sometimes they just may be too crowded. You don't want them to be too crowded. You may want to thin them out get them to be that they said somewhere between you know nine and nine and 15 canes per meter okay great we i sneakily put up a poll while we were asking the questions i asked to everybody have you grown any berries before so 71 percent of everybody attending says they have grown berries and 28 percent have not so now let's do a little time check. We have 23 minutes and let's do some blueberries and we'll see if we can fit. You've got some other berries at the end that I'd love to uh, include as well. So I will uh, hand it over to you again, Kevin. Okay? okay. So blueberry site selection, again, a lot of the similar things uh, that, that we talked about before, but if uh, I talked to, to one blueberry expert, a good, a good friend of mine from New Jersey, and he'll tell you that the secret to growing blueberries, there's three things you need to know. pH, pH, and pH. As you see, the, the value of, um, of uh, pH for optimal blueberry growth is on the acid side, 4.5 to 5.2. And so it is very, very critical that you have the correct pH when you plant and you're able to maintain a low pH. So if you learn nothing else about blueberries, know that pH is, is the root of all evils from, 
than what uh, uh, Gary Pavlos from, from New Jersey would say. So um, blueberries have uh, fibrous roots. Um, so well-drained soil is very important. They've got these hairy fibrous roots, so they don't like to sit in water either. Um, again, water is just a, it starves, starves the plants of oxygen and they shut down. And uh, so usually a plant can stay, can stay in a saturated state for, you know, 24 hours. Once you get 48 hours, you're, you're kind of asking for trouble. So drainage is pretty, pretty important. After all the rain we've had, you see a lot of water laying around. So you want to make sure that you've got good drainage on a blueberry. So when you're buying blueberry plants, keep in mind that they come in a variety of sizes and ages and you basically pay accordingly. Um, so you buy a bigger plant, it's gonna be more expensive. You know, you can buy plants from one-year-olds to five-year-olds, um, depending on what you, what you order from the nursery. But, you know, with any varieties, I should say there's any of them, is that you always wanna order early to make sure you get the varieties you want. In the case of blueberries, because of cross-pollination, you need at least two varieties, very similar to something like apples, where you need two, two Two different varieties to pollinate each other. Um, blueberries have a funny, um, funny flower structure, and it makes it difficult for honeybees to pollinate them. And uh, that's why it's been proven time and time again that bumblebees are the best pollinators for for blueberries. So that's something just to be aware of because they've got this long extended flower. It's difficult for uh, honeybees to get in there. So sometimes they cheat and go in the side. And uh, in this way, you're not really getting pollination. You're just there getting some nectar, perhaps stealing a bit of pollen. Um, blueberry varieties, I think, are uh, um, there's a lot of different ones. Patriot, Northland are very hardy varieties. Uh, or they're hard, more plenty hardy for this area, anyways, of southern Ontario. Uh, Duke is um, we're learning it's not as hardy as we once thought it was it's the most, probably the most productive one of the most productive varieties um, and it's early and that's why a lot of if you go to british columbia which is the largest blueberry producer in north america um you know they're probably 80 percent of what's planted out there at duke so it's great because it's a good production but what happens is they all the production comes in at the same time so it's hard in the market you've got some other varieties if you're growing in in a cooler part of Ontario, uh, North Blue, uh, Chippewa, North Country, these are varieties typically that were bled in, or sorry, bred in uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin for colder climates. Patriot, you, might, you can typically grow in, in eastern Ontario and, and maybe as far as, uh, it wouldn't go much further than uh, Barry if you're heading north. Um, there's some new varieties, or I mean, Aurora, Liberty, and Draper have been out for like four or five years. I think all three of them come from a Michigan breeding program, and that's where a lot of the, there's been a lot of breeding going on uh, in Michigan. They have a big uh, industry there. New Jersey has a big industry, so some of the varieties come out of New Jersey as well. <clears throat> and now a lot of, uh, on the West Coast, there's a lot of blue, uh, blueberry varieties coming out of there as well. Um, so blueberry soil preparation, um, basically you're doing the same thing, managing the weeds, adjusting the pH as we talked about, Doing some subsoiling again, drainage is pretty important. So that's uh, basically what you're what you're after. Here you see these are some large plants. These are probably maybe four or five year old plants in large pots. And what you'll see here, and I don't know how it shows very well, but what you've got is they basically they dug out a bit of a trench um, and they filled the base with um, with peat. So the important thing is if you're is is we often recommend peat. Uh, in the planting hole, or in this case, in a in a, in a uh, trough type system in the soil, um, but the peat. Be careful with peat. Is that most pHs are low are low pH, low, low in pH in the fours, typically in the fours, which is what you want. But there are a few places where uh, where you can have peat that has a pH of seven. So just something that you want to talk to your supplier about, or just be able to take a do a pH test on on the peat that you're using. That just shows uh, that uh, planting after being planted, those plants don't look quite so big anymore. But this planting, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could fruit it. I highly suggest you don't. Basically, grow it, put this out, um, pick all the blossoms off the first year, let it, let it establish, get its roots growing out into the soil, 
and then uh, perhaps harvest it the following year. In the cases of small one-year-old plants, typically growers will pick up uh, bloom probably at least for the first two seasons before they harvest a little bit in the third season. And blueberries in most cases takes about year, approximately year six or seven to get into full production. But we do see blueberry plants that are, you know, 50 years old. So that's something just to uh, know that it's a, it's a, it could be a long-term commitment. Oh, just a pretty shot of some uh, of some uh, bright blueberries, and uh, <clears throat> so planting again. You're preparing the soil. You're setting those plants as we talked about. Irrigation is pretty important after, um, as with others. We see sawdust or wood chips being used as a mulch, um, and this is pretty common and is very advantageous uh, to uh, blueberries. Really do. Uh, improve yields when you put that uh, mulch layer on top of them. Of course, you get weed managed with it, a bit of pest management with it. It's uh, good for managing a couple of diseases. And uh, the other thing you have to be aware of with blueberries is that they're very attractive to birds. So you, we have different systems for bird management. From the the best one would be netting, bird netting over over planting. But also there's different scaring devices, and now we're seeing things like drones flying out to scare birds and lasers and so on. So different techniques, uh, but uh, by and large, the best one is uh, is the uh, is the netting. And then of course there's uh, pruning at some point in time. Typically you don't prune plantings until they're probably five five years old or older before you start. Other than pruning out dead branches. Um, you're not pruning out plants to like I said, they're at least five to seven years old. Okay, we're, we're through blueberries very quickly. Anything? That was great. Awesome. Okay, very effective. Um, I'm just going to put up a quick, uh, another quick poll. And I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then we will plow on because we have about 15 minutes left. So Anthony and guys, feel free to put some questions in the, the chat box. Anthony asks, when is the best time to transplant berry plants if you have to? And would it be easier to transplant a raspberry compared to a blueberry? Um, what you saw there with the blueberries is there, you know, those ones are planted in, in pots. So when you have a potted plant, it's a lot more forgiving than something that has uh, no soil or or bare root. Um, anytime you're transplanting, you want you want to transplant them when the plants aren't actively growing. So first thing in the spring is obviously an ideal time, but there's there's also an opportunity to uh, to uh, transplant in the fall later in the fall. I think we, as I said, you don't want them to be terribly actively growing, and you don't want temperatures to be you know excessively hot. Um, that just adds stress that you don't really want to add you know you, when when transplanting or any planting you want to make sure you've got adequate moisture and there's not a lot of stress in the plants great and amber asks would it be better to propagate raspberry and blackberry bushes through seed or cuttings if i were to take cuttings from a bush would it uh, would the cutting take a long time to root and establish itself so blueberries are typically uh, propagated by cuttings um there's there's hardwood cuttings and softwood cuttings. I think for the most part now that they take softwood cuttings, and so that's that's typically the way it's. Um, I think I'm, I'm I'm not sure what the softwood. I know the hardwood cuttings when we used to do them were always uh, grown in a mix of sand and peat about 50-50, and um, the success rate with hardwood cuttings were, yeah, if you got 70-80 percent, you're really really happy. Softwood cuttings and misting. The, um, the the success rates a lot higher. Hmm. Um, from a raspberry standpoint, um, raspberries are typically uh, they're usually dug in the fall. or dug the first thing in the spring when they're dormant and um, and planted as a dormant as a dormant plant. Um, you know, dug from the ground and you're basically planting those cane, canes out. So again, you can do it in spring or fall, but uh, just be aware of it. So typically in raspberries aren't done from cuttings. They will do root cuttings sometimes, but that's kind of another, another whole game in itself. Okay, quick question from Charlie. I have grown some blueberries in the past and have struggled with blueberry maggot. I've researched the topic, but I would like to know the speaker's approach to dealing with this pest issue. 
I would also like to know if there's a specific cultivar that produces the highest yield of blueberries. So let's focus here on the blueberry maggot issue. Yeah, blueberry maggot is tough um, if you have it. It's, and there's really, I mean, you can manage it. Obviously, there's some hurt. There's some uh, insecticides that you could use to manage blueberry maggot. You can monitor for it. Uh, they do have uh, yellow sticky traps, uh, volatile traps that you can use to uh, as a monitoring tool. Uh, I don't know whether you can mass trap them. It'd probably be difficult if you put a lot of traps out. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's it is a difficult pest to uh, to manage. Um, looking at the highest yielding, um, probably different growers would tell you different things. Blue crop. Uh, has always been very popular in Ontario, always very productive historically. Duke, as I mentioned before, can be very productive as well. And we're thinking some of these newer varieties have, uh, have some good production as well. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to end the poll. The results you will see, 94% um, of the people on the line think it's really fun and interactive to do a webinar. That's great. 5% of you say it's kind of hard to tune in on time and connection isn't good. Sorry about that, guys. And 0% says it's okay, but uses up too much data. I was just curious about that. Okay, Ben's last question leads into what we're going to talk about in the next, let's go for five to seven minutes. Um, yeah. He says, what are the best berry plants and trees native to Eastern North America that you would recommend growing? And I know you're going to talk a bit about that. Okay. I would say that the, the native native plants, um, just as, you know, strawberries are one that's very versatile. You can go, we have strawberries being grown in Alaska and strawberries being grown in Thunder Bay, Ontario and all the way across. So, so they're very, <clears throat> they, their suitability is they can grow almost anywhere with the right under the right conditions. So that may be one you can consider. Saskatoons or June berries, um, as they're called, so called, and uh, service berries, I guess, is the other name for them. Um, they're a native. They're a native, and they grow pretty much anywhere in Canada. Very hardy, broad adaptability. You don't need the. They're adapted to different pHs, um, so they're a little bit easier. The one thing you will recognizes birds really like them they as much or more than blueberries and most people from a marketing standpoint don't know any, don't know anything about them unless they've got some roots in western canada and the prairies where they, where they more commonly grow okay so let's go on you've got about five minutes and we'll wrap up the webinar and uh yeah I'll okay so hand it about, over i just talked to hit a little bit on about current or Saskatoon, so talk about maybe a little bit more about them with some pictures. Uh, currants and gooseberries we can grow, very hardy. Um, they have some marketing challenges because they're just not as, you don't pick up a, a currant or a gooseberry and, and and have that same sweet flavor as you would have with uh, the other three berries we've talked about so far. Uh, Hascaps, this is something, of, it's a blue honeysuckle, uh, but the name Hascap, very hardy, um, early plant, it's uh, something that's new. Uh, it picks right around the same time or maybe a little bit earlier than strawberries. And it's a new crop that you probably hear more and more about. But we're, again, we've got a market uh, that we've got, to, uh, we've got to consider. Yeah, I can't advance my slide. Oh, that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, some other berries, cranberries. Uh, it's a big investment uh, from, a, from an establishment standpoint. Uh, the market's been terrible lately. Um, Guys are basically getting out of the business because they're not making any money. You need, can need large water, volumes of water if you're water harvesting. And um, it, anyways, it's it's very interesting. I, I, I think cranberries are just fascinating and I really find them interesting. Uh, sea buckthorn is another one that uh, there's a lot of new berries that talked about. This one you'll see a little bit out, extremely high in vitamin C. Again, it's something new and it's something you'd probably end up processing because it's not but really good fresh variety. Okay, here's so just, I'm gonna take you through some really nice pretty pictures of, of uh, cranberries. Cranberries are not grown in water. So people think they're grown in water, they are not grown in water. They like well-drained soil, just like any other berry type in most, um, most uh, horticultural plants. What you see here is a dike. And so these, there's, this, there's a berm that's all the way around this planting. And they use this because they harvest uh, cranberries um, by using water, and I'll show you some nice pictures of that. So this is, um, there's some different ways of planting cranberries. This is, um, we, we did a trial a number of years ago where we were growing them from, we grew them as transplant, transplants and planted them out. 
if they're very good. We apply them very close together because as you saw from this previous slide, that is a solid mat of cranberries. So it's just all cranberries. There's probably a number of weeds in there too eventually, but that's a solid mat of cranberries. So this is one way of planting that's been uh, experimented with a little bit and done in some locations. But typically this is how they're planted. They basically, they take cuttings from the, uh, the, the uh, dormant cuttings, take them, and they uh, basically spread them out over the out over the soil and then run these, they're basically it's a modified disc. It pushes these cuttings into the soil and they'll root. They'll root there. They've, you know, obviously you've put far more out there than you need, but uh, the rooting is amazingly enough, they, uh, they root just like that. And this is just a shot of uh, a new, a new um, cranberry planting as they root. You can see, if you look closely, you can see there's a lot of uh, runners that come out to help fill in the fill in the space. But that's a shot of the cranberries. And I think uh, you have to look very close. You can see some blooms on here, and then yeah, the very indiscriminate uh, flowers that cranberry, cranberries have. And here's just a shot. This is what happens. So basically, the cranberries grow. In those in those beds that we showed you, and then at some point in the year they flood them, they go they drive across this field in a special piece of equipment, and a beat with a beater bar or some type of thing to knock the berries off. The berries float to the surface. Um, they tend the wind tends to blow them in one direction. They put uh, they put a a boom out there to corral them. You'll see in this picture here, terrible color, but in this picture they're using this boom and they'll bring it over. And basically, they'll either use an elevator or um, a pump to pump those blueberries out of the field. Or cranberries, sorry, cranberries. So yeah, cranberry is very interesting, uh, but a big investment because most times they will tell you, oh, you've got to plant uh, uh, tw you know, 20 acres to to uh, to get to the right things. Um, this is just a shot of uh, Saskatoon flowers, uh, very pretty uh, flowers. Um, this is a, a newer, younger planting. Sask Saskatoon berries will grow up to be eight or ten feet tall if you let them. Um, so you usually, by about seven years, you're starting to cut out old branches. And here's just a shot of a uh, picture. They kind of look like a blueberry, but they're actually from the apple family, um, and they're a little bit they, so they have a little bit of crunch. They're a fantastic berry for processing and jams and things like that. And maybe not. I mean, everybody has different tastes, but I prefer a blueberry over over Saskatoon. Fresh, but I would prefer a Saskatoon pie over a blueberry pie. They're that good. And you can see here the netting that this grower has up here to protect against birds. Um, lastly, just a couple pictures of uh, elderberries. This is prior to bloom in elderberries. And they grow, you'll see them in ditch banks, very common in this area and in the Niagara region. You'll see elderberries growing wild. They're pretty easy to establish, but the market again is difficult. You'll see these dark berries. You're we're starting to see people interested in elderflower wine as something new. And they actually use, we, one of the growers in Ontario was growing a lot and harvesting and shipping them as a natural dye um, to uh, and sending to places like Japan as a natural food coloring or a dye um, because they're super dark, uh, like a dark purpley, almost black that they get. So anyways, that, that wraps that up. Yeah, I know we're running out of time. So. That was amazing. And we squeezed so much into this webinar. So I want to thank you, Kevin, so much for spending the time with us, for doing the preparation to put to, putting together the slides. Guys, thank Kevin for being with us today. I hope you learned a lot. Remember in uh, to write down five different things you've learned today from the webinar about growing berries, something new. Hopefully you learned something new. And also um, Niagara College people, um, Mary Jane will be talking more about berries with you, making sure you know exactly all the different berries and what are the growing conditions you need and how do you grow them. So everybody is saying thank you so much, Kevin, in the chat wow. box. They are so wow. happy. Oh my gosh, I learned so many new and exciting things, Morgan said. And we will be cut off in just a minute, but let's just see. Yeah, so sorry, I would love to run over time, but this particular webinar software just conks out if we do more than two hours. Thanks, Kevin, everybody's saying. So Kevin, I hope you'll come back again sometime and chat with us more about berries and your wonderful right. work. Right, you're very welcome. Okay.
Okay, guys, stay safe and stay socially distant. But, you know, be in touch with people on the phone. That's the best way to be in touch. And I hope you have fun. And I hope to put up this video soon. So if you missed parts of it, you can go back. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye bye. Time to tune out. Bye bye.